couple of days ago, I got a message from Matt. Matt wrote, I have a question I'm hoping you can help me with. I completed a short course recently, and during this course, there were a lot of pop-up quiz question elements on some slides. For example, and this is something I'd like to utilize myself, after a conversation scenario completed, a pop-up rating scale appeared. It appeared to be on the same slide. Question was issued depending on the, or sorry, feedback was issued depending on the score clicked, and then it went seamlessly to a multiple choice question about next steps. Could you please demo how this can be achieved and whether a quote unquote pop up can be achieved for different quiz types? Thank you and keep the videos coming. They are the best resource available for learning Captivate. Uh, thanks, Matt. That's an excellent compliment, and I really do appreciate it. I think I have a solution for you. Let's take a look at what I've come up with here. So the idea of a pop-up, I figure, is very much a timeline based. Now, I imagine that there's probably a number of ways you could do this, but I simply chose to turn my pop-up question into a grouped object so that it would be easy for me to work on the rest of the slide and then simply have that grouped object appear on my timeline after a certain amount of time. In this case, I chose a point in the narration of this particular slide uh, to have this appear because that's when the question is actually read uh, or narrated to the user. Let me give you a preview of what this looks like. Your team often orders takeout for lunch on Fridays. Usually it's fast food. Sunita is a vegetarian and often sits at another part of the cafeteria when the team enjoys their takeout lunch. What could the team do to make this more inclusive and respectful towards Sunita? So again, it was just a design, design decision to have this pop-up appear when the, the actual words or the stem of the question is being read. To be clear, this pop-up isn't really anything more than a series of smart shapes. In fact, it's seven smart shapes to be precise. Uh, six of them you can very easily see. There's the question stem, which includes the pop-up background. There are the four answers, which are being which are simply smart shapes being used as buttons. There's also a, a submit button as well. And what the, the one object that you can't see is a feedback box. And I decided to make that a multi-state object. So rather than having five different feedback caption items, I just had one. And then I'll have the advanced action that I'll subsequently write um, display the appropriate multi-state object or multi-state uh, depending on what has been selected and submitted. Now I've done this sort of thing before where I've created my own multiple choice question and I'll put a link actually up here uh, where you can see an example of one of my more recent ones uh, but you could certainly apply a lot of the same principles of what I'll show you today into not just multiple choice single answer questions, which is what I've done here, but also multiple choice multiple answers. You could do a, a rating scale with this uh, very similar pro approach, uh, or you could even do a true false and that would certainly work as well. So let me take you through this step by step. Some of these decisions that I'm going to include in this are not mandatory. They're just design, design decisions that I've made. The first one of those is that I decided to reset the slide on entry. In some of my other videos, I maybe don't show this, but you have to consider what happens when your learners, when your users of your e-learning course, return to a slide a second time. So you may have changed the appearance of objects, like for example, in this particular case, I'm going to hide the left arrow and the right arrow button, um, but do I want them to be hidden if the user comes to this slide a second time? It's an interesting question. Uh, those are design decisions that you need to make, but I'll show you what I've done. I've created a reset slide on entry advanced action. Um, advanced actions, for those that aren't super familiar with them, are any kind of uh, actions or group of actions when you need to have two or more things occur. So in this case here, I have a bunch of things happening and I'll show you what the advanced action looks like. And this brings me to 
a point in this conversation where I think it's important to uh, spend the extra time labeling all your objects. And you'll see as you get into advanced actions, you'll see the importance of this. For example, um, in this case here, and I'm just going to move the advanced action window to the right a bit. You can see I've got all these objects on screen. Every single one of them that I'm interacting with has a specific name. So the left and right arrows, for example, are called left arrow, right arrow. So they're easy to find in the drop downs that I'm going to choose. So when you're building an advanced action, you don't want it to simply be uh, smart shape 27 or uh, image 42 and things like that. It, it's very complicated to build advanced actions if you don't know what all your objects are called. So I've taken the time and I'm going to hide the left arrow and the right arrow every time the user comes into the slide. In other words, I'm going to force them to do this interaction every time they come back here. So perhaps I'm doing this for remediation purposes. Uh, I don't know. That's just a choice I made in this particular instance. I'm going to change the state of that feedback square back to normal. So in case of, if it was left uh, in a condition other than normal, I'm going to change it back to that. I'm also going to change the state of all of my selection buttons back to normal. Um, shouldn't really need that, but as a precaution, that's probably a good thing to do. And I'm also going to enable these buttons because actually later on I'll show you that I'll be disabling them from further... Uh, from further clicks. So this runs every time a user comes into this slide and it returns the knowledge check back to its original state. So let me close that and I'll talk a little bit now about the selection button. So I have four choices in this multiple choice question and uh, you need to keep track of whether the user has clicked these objects or not and the best way to do that is also through an advanced action. But before you do the advanced action, you're actually going to need to create some variables. So let's go into our project drop down menu and go to the variables window. And I'll show you those variables. Very simple to create. Simply add new, give each of your variable a name. And like the other objects that you're putting on screen, your variables should have meaningful names. So I'm calling these var underscore answer one, answer two, answer three, answer four. I'm giving them an initial value of zero and saving those and I'll be working with those. And you'll see how those apply to the advanced action in a moment. So I have four different advanced actions. I'm going to show you what they look like. They're all very similar to one another. So once you've created one, you'll be able to duplicate that advanced action using this icon right here and make a few changes so that you can create action two, action three, and action four. So in this case here, this is for action one, which is the first button. I'm gonna change the state of answer one, which is the button itself, to selected. I'm also gonna change the state of the remaining buttons in case this is the second or third attempt at this multiple choice question. I'm gonna change those back to normal I'm going to assign those variables with a value of 1, 0, 0, 0, right, for answer 1, 2, 3, and 4. And you might be wondering, well, why do I need to assign uh, variable answer 2, 3, and 4 with a 0 when they're already 0? Again, this might be the second attempt, and one of these variables may already be assigned a value of 1. To show that it's not selected, you're going to return it back to 0. Because again, only in this case, uh, only one answer can be selected at a time. If you were doing a multiple answer question, you would do this a bit differently. And again, you can watch the video on how to do uh, a multiple answer uh, video, and I'll show that here as well. The final thing I'm, I'm going to do is I'm going to change the state of my feedback square back to normal. So in other words, uh, if someone is making a second attempt and the feedback says, sorry, that answer is incorrect, I want that to go back to blank so that we're going to refresh that part of the screen and um, possibly set it up for its next feedback that you'll see. 
And again, there's a, a duplicate version of these, so answer two. The only difference with answer two is that we're changing the state of answer one back to normal and changing the state of answer two to selected instead of the other way around and assigning the variable answer one with zero and assigning variable answer two with one instead of the other way around. And you know, the same thing for three and the same thing for four. So one of those four actions is run with each one. So you can see here in the Actions tab of my Properties panel for the button one, it's running Action 1. Button two is running Action 2. Three is three, four is four. I've also done uh, a small thing to these buttons as well. I've checked off uh, the hand cursor this will give users a visual indicator that these are clickable boxes or, or buttons, if you will. And I've also checked off disable the click sound, mostly because I'm not a fan of the click sound that's built into Adobe Captivate. You could change that if you have a different uh, click sound in mind. Uh, and that can be done, of course, uh, through the Options tab and you can add audio there. But uh, I'm just going to leave them with no sound. Then the, uh, the fifth button on this particular pop-up interaction is a submit button. I've done the same thing and checked off hand cursor and double click, disable the click sound. But the submit is now going to validate which answer you selected and then uh, take the appropriate actions depending on which choice the user has made. So let me show you what that advanced action looks like. So this is a bit more complicated, and the reason it's complicated because we're going to actually choose uh, one of four possible outcomes. Anytime you have more than two possible outcomes, you need to make multiple decisions. So with conditional actions, we're, we're asking the system, we're asking Adobe Captivate, if these conditions are true, do this set of steps or do this set of actions. You can also have else, which is otherwise, you know, so do this set of actions or if the opposite was true or if the condition is not true, do this second set of actions. But again, I've actually got four possible, I've actually got five possible um, scenarios here. So instead of using the else function, I actually have these different decisions. They're very similar to one another. So you can use the duplicate decision icon, which is located right here, to duplicate much of your work and then just make a few small changes. But I'll take you through each of these decisions so you understand what's happening on screen. So the first one is incomplete. And what that means literally is the user has not made a selection but tried to hit submit. So if the variables of all four of my tracking variables are zero, I want to change the state of my feedback square to incomplete, right? So in other words, it's gonna say, sorry, that's incomplete. Please make a selection and try again. Then if I've got uh, this opportunity here where the variable answer one is equal to one and all the other answers are equal to zero, I'm going to change the state of the feedback square to answer one. Similarly for answer two, I'm going to change the feedback to answer two. And similarly, answer three, change the feedback square to answer three. So those are very similar. The fourth option is actually the more desirable of all four choices. So I've got some additional things happening there. If we look at that decision, you can see we're checking, of course, the variable. If it's variable answer four is equal to one and the others are zero, then we're going to change the state of the feedback square to answer four, just like the other decisions. But we're also going to disable these buttons here. Disable answer one, disable answer two, three, and four. In other words, it will prevent the user from making a different choice once they've selected the correct answer. And the additional final step will be to show the navigation control so that the user can either click the right arrow or click the left arrow and proceed with the rest of the course. 
And that's pretty much it. I know it looks a little complicated, but once you've built one or two of these pop-up knowledge checks or multiple choice or, or rating questions, you'll find they're not too bad. Let's do a preview of this project and see how all that comes together. Your team often orders takeout for lunch on Fridays. Usually it's fast food. Sanita is a vegetarian and often sits at another part of the cafeteria when the team enjoys their takeout lunch. What could the team do to make this more inclusive and respectful towards Sanita? So as you can see, the pop-up shows up at the appropriate time. And of course, let's check out the interactive elements here. Uh, first of all, the navigation controls, the, the placeholders are the only things that are visible. The actual left and right arrows are not visible presently. And we have our remaining choices here, so we can make a choice. And as you can see, the selection process works. I can select one and it resets the others back to normal. And then let's try the submit function and see if that gives us the feedback we're expecting. So the first one here, organize a potluck where there are choices for everyone. Hit submit. And we see our feedback message. Organizing a potluck where there are choices for everyone is a great idea. Consider if there's a better answer to this question. Try again. So let's try the third option. And you can see it, once I click on another obje object or another button, it clears out the previous feedback, which is the uh, effect that I was looking for. And you'll see that within your advanced actions. Let's hit submit. Asking Sunita to join them is a great choice, but I think there's more you can do. Try again. So let's choose that fourth option, which is any or all of the above are great examples of promoting an inclusive and respectful workplace. So we hit submit. Fantastic. Implementing all these ideas at various times is a great way to have a more inclusive and respectful workplace. So you notice that when I selected the fourth option, a couple of things happened. The left and right arrows are now visible, which is great. So I can navigate away from this page. And of course, the instructions in my feedback say click the right arrow to continue. But the other thing is, is that my buttons are disabled, so I can't make another choice and hit submit. This interaction is now finished, and we're ready to move on with the rest of the project. If you thought this video was useful, please share it with your colleagues. If you need help building your next e-learning project, consider hiring me. My focus is to create effective learning that helps you achieve your business goals. Visit my website at paulwilsonlearning.com. Follow me on Twitter at PaulWilsonLD, and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel.